recording. Okay. Oh, all right. I have to mind your professor. And I do realize I don't have the best background yet <clears throat> for making videos. I've got to figure out a room in the house that has like bookshelves or something. Make it look more scholarly, I suppose. Okay. So now that we've covered in the previous video lecture what tropes are, you know, figurative language and the importance of metaphorical language. We're going to go through some of the various essential terms, uh, the terms of figurative language that um, I'd like you guys to be familiar with and to use um, in this, uh, in your writing and discussion and stuff like that. And the major tropes we'll be looking at is metaphor, simile, metonymy, personification, pathetic fallacy, irony, imagery, symbolism. Um, and these lectures are real, video lectures are just sort of designed to help you by walking you through these. You can find, I've got a couple really nice handouts. I think I put them in week three or week four. You'll find them there. Um, that gives a nice rundown and definition uh, of these different tropes for you all. But let's just talk through uh, these tropes. I'd like to begin with simile um, rather than metaphor. Um, as a literary device, because uh, simile is really a, it's a form of metaphor. Matter of fact, all of these tropes really are metaphor, um, but they just use comparisons in different kinds of ways. What makes a, a simile distinct is it's making a comparison between two very dissimilar things, two unlike things, but it's doing so by explicitly stating the comparison by using the words like or as. So it has those connectors, whereas a metaphor doesn't, which means metaphor is a lot more, like we were describing in the last video, really a lot more diffuse throughout all of language. Similes has, it's a place where a poet makes a very sort of focused comparison uh, within a poem. Uh, so the most important aspect of any trope like a simile, is that the poet is always implying something or connoting something that's not being directly expressed by the language itself. So figuring out what a poet is implying is what we mean by the metaphor reading between the lines. So let's look at an example of a simile from the poem Barbie Doll, the second poem that we did a close reading on together. And as you recall in that poem, and towards the middle of the poem, people are exhorting uh, the girl child who can't fit in and doesn't feel adequate in life. They're exhorting her to remember to come on hardy, to smile, to diet, to wheedle, you know, to come on strong, to, you know, be a go-getter, kinds of stuff, to act coy, and all of these different things. But then it says right after that, and here's the simile, her good nature wore out like a fan belt. Her good nature wore out like a fan belt. And so this is simile. Two very dissimilar things are being connected here by the word like. In other words, someone's good nature, like the girl's child, girl child's, is nothing like a fan belt. So we don't have something literal here. Therefore, the task of close reading, what we've been doing, is to try to determine what the poet is implying by comparing the girl child's worn out good nature to a fan belt. So the traditional and effective way to do this is to recognize and then to separate the two different things that are being compared. In fact, the best thing to do is to have separate pieces of paper or a hard copy of the poem so you can write these things down. It's easier to do that than trying to keep, keep it going around in your head. And that'll give you the opportunity when it becomes important to write down what these two different elements of the comparison mean or what you associate to them. Um, because also many times it'll become helpful to state in your own words what the elements of comparison are. So here are the two elements in that simile that are being compared. The girl child worn out good nature and a fan belt. <clears throat> Importantly, you might have to determine what these two elements actually are. For instance, what is someone's good nature? 
And what does it mean for it to be worn out? You know, generally think, right, of good nature as being somebody's demeanor, their personality, their identity, you know, the, their kindness, the way they approach life, those essential things. We think of somebody's human nature as the essential things that make us who we are as human beings. So see, writing down these types of things when you're doing your own interpretations can be, you know, an excellent way then to have things you can write about. You might also notice, by the way, that using the term good nature is actually a metaphor, you know, since there's no other way to describe the soul <laughs> or the nature of a human. You know, we, we call it that nature of the human being. But more of that later on metaphor. So then we got that element of the comparison. So next, what's a fan belt? If you don't know, well, the best thing to do is look it up and go on your phone and use the, you know, Google and type in fan belt. And I guarantee you'll get a, you'll get a definition. I can't overemphasize what a good thing it is to look up things, you words and phrases you don't know, but even those words and phrases you do know to see how a poet might, what kind of definition a poet might be using. For instance, in my papa's waltz, the word beat, you know, we think of that one primary meeting, be, meaning beating somebody up or pummeling somebody. But then we discover that beat also meant, right, the rhythm and music, the backbeat, something that keeps the music timed. Anyhow, if you looked up a fan belt, you would discover that what a fan belt is, is a very thick rubber band that connects all of the various parts of an engine and keeps an engine running and keeps it running smoothly. So, here you have them, the two elements of a comparison. So by doing this, by having these two elements of comparison, you've got basically what are known as the tenor and the vehicle of a simile or any trope. You know, all tropes are comparisons, and so all tropes have a tenor and a vehicle. So the tenor of the comparison is the literal thing that's being compared. In this case, it's the girl child's good nature is the literal thing that's being compared. Whereas the vehicle is the figural thing that's transporting that literal thing into the figural comparison. Therefore, the vehicle of the simile would be the fan belt. So tenor of the simile is her good nature, the literal thing, and it's being compared to that that's going to take it into a figural realm, the piece of thick rubber band, a fan belt that keeps the engine parts together. So now comes the tricky part. You know, having the two elements separated, that's one step, but the tricky part then is interpreting what the poet might be implying with this comparison. And this is where your creativity comes in. And for those of you who love to examine things in depth, interpreting what is being implied by a trope is the name of the game when examining poetry. So in this case, you'd have to ask yourself, why? Is someone's worn out good nature similar to a fan belt? Well, think about what a fan belt does. It keeps the parts of an engine together and moving. It keeps things running in a car engine, so to speak. Is not our own good nature something that keeps our own human engine together and moving and moving smoothly? But in the poem, the poor girl child's good nature is worn out, right? So think about the engine of your own car. And by the way, if you lift up the hood of your car, you would see all the many fan belts connecting all the moving parts. And if it's running, you'd see the fan belts going round and round and round. Do you think that those fan belts stay the same after tens of thousands of miles of driving? No, they wear out. That's why you get a tune-up for your car and you get them replaced. So what do you think happens when an essential fan belt in your car wears out enough, where it wears to the point that it can't work anymore? What, for instance, what happens when a rubber band is stretched too far? Exactly. Bang! It snaps. So once you brainstorm like this, 
then certain things start to come up and become clearer as you're trying to interpret a poem. A worn out fan belt snaps. And if it snaps, the engine stops working. And if you've ever been driving a car on the highway when its fan belt snaps, you know what happens. Very quickly, your car rolls off to the side of the road and steam begins exploding out of the hood. So, now that you know this, what might this be saying about the girl child's good nature? If it is worn out, doesn't that suggest that she snaps? Like a car whose fan belt has snapped? Does this not suggest that the girl child has broken down? Hence, a breakdown, right? Cars break down, humans break down. One's a mechanical breakdown, the other one's an emotional breakdown. The next lines, of course, in the poem are that she cuts off her nose and her legs and offers them up. So yes, indeed, obviously a breakdown. Now, folks, finally, a deeper, closer reading entails asking then, why is a poet using this specific simile? Of all things, to compare a nervous breakdown to, why the parts of an engine that breaks down? Why something mechanical? Uh, to describe the poor girl's nervous breakdown. Again, this is where your interpretive creativity comes in and you can brainstorm. For instance, what is a Barbie doll? It's, a, it's something manufactured, right? It's something mechanical. Think of the descriptions in the first stanzas of the poem. Everything points to the girl's not, the girl not, not working and flourishing as a human being but is a mechanical object being constructed. Think of the lines before the fan belt simile, how she is told to exercise, diet, smile, wheedle, come on arty, act strong, be coy, you know, keep running, keep running, keep puffing and puffing, keep that girly engine humming, so to speak. So it ends up making, you know, complete sense that you're fan belt or your good nature would wear out and snap, having a breakdown. Matter of fact, on a physiological level, of course, our bodies can keep going and going. And if we don't take care of ourselves and have too much stress or we keep, you know, under too much stress and a lot of exertion, yeah, we eventually either emotionally or physically break down. So, guys, I gave you a nice, dense, close reading of the way to, un to read a simile. Uh, so that you'll be able to maybe be creative and practice doing similar things with some of the other poems that we have. And there's plenty of similes in those. So for the next lecture, we'll talk about the uh, of metaphor as a device. I know we talked about metaphor in general as the dominant trope of tropes, but we'll talk in the next video about how metaphor is used as a specific device in poetry. See ya.